good morning and welcome to the worship service this morning. I'm going to ask that we stand and sing together, praise him. Then please remain standing for a word of prayer. Turn in uh, your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to read verses 1 through 6. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun, and the land of Naphtali, and afterwards did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light, that they dwell in the land of the shadow of death. Upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. They joy before thee accordingly in the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be the burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the great God that you are, for the uh, way you watch over us, the way you lead and guide us if we are tuned into your um, 
to your word. I ask that you would uh, bless every aspect this morning of the service, uh, that from the singing uh, to the pastor speaking to us. I'm thankful to be here today. Um, and the time we were able to spend with families uh, this past week, I ask that you would continue to um, help us look for opportunities to, to share the good news um, that we're called to do that. I ask that you would be with um, some of those in our church that are experiencing some medical uh, trials right now, that you would be with Betty Bibler and, and Robin as they're uh, both having upcoming surgery, that you would just be dear to them at this time, uh, that you would be with them. I ask that you would uh, um, just go before them, give them the peace that only comes from you. I ask that you would uh, be with um, uh, Nancy and Gerald Glick this morning, that you would just be with her and be with uh, Gerald as he helps, and that you would just uh, be close to them, that you would be with the family uh, at this time, uh, and uh, just uh, go before them. I just ask that you would help us to... Um, Continue this spirit of Thanksgiving um, throughout the year, but not just just and you know just one week of the year. That you'd help us to know that you're in control, and that you are a great and mighty God. And the the number one thing you want from us is our obedience, uh, so that we can uh, follow you. I ask that you would just uh, be here today in this place. We ask all these things in your name, Amen. All right, as Jay was praying, it reminded me that uh, back on the table in the back, Gerald came here early, Gerald Glick, but he told me he had to go over to the nursing home because Nancy was having a really rough morning. But uh, there are some of the CDs that she has produced with her harp, and they're Christmas CDs, and he says they're there for the taking. So during handshake time, if you'd like to stop by and get a, pick up a CD for Chris, uh, with Christmas music on Nancy's harp from years ago, those are available. I see uh, Clayton and Rachel and little Josiah made it uh, down from Grand Rapids to be with us today, and he's going to be singing for us here in a little bit. With us, I guess. I don't know how that's going to work. He's going to surprise me, but uh, it's going to be good. I know that. Let's all say good morning to one another and uh, just take a few minutes and do that.
as we begin to find our way back to our places, we will be singing Be Glorified this morning. This time, if I understood right, Josiah's coming. No, I guess it's Clay. <laughs> I uh, got added to the program. Sorry about that, a little loud. Uh, I always want to try to give you an update about the youth, and it's perfect that Clayton is here. First of all, winter retreat is January 24th to 26th at Pine Ridge. Uh, so we're, the kids are going up there. I know high school athletes, it's probably not going to happen. But junior high coach, especially in Arlington, I have contacted them. We're going to leave Friday afternoon, or Morgan's going to leave with them Friday afternoon. They can go. In fact, the junior high coaches encouraged it. So please sign up ASAP, January 24 to the 26th, winter retreat at Pine Ridge. Uh, it'll be a very, very good experience. The second thing, what have we been talking about? Telling your story. Very unique teaching philosophy that I had this morning. I walked in five minutes late, intentionally. I sat down, looked at him, and said, I got nothing. You know what the reaction was? They started talking amongst themselves. Folks, how many times do people say, hey, what's your story? And you respond, I got nothing. Even believers, I got nothing. And guess what the world does? Okay, let's go about the rest of our day. Here's my challenge to you. Ask, ask one of the kids. They all figured out today, they've got the story. In fact, we went around and they figured out they got the greatest story ever told to tell. I challenge you to pray for them for that. So pray for them for that. And the second thing is, we had a little bit of hookup on the mission trip. If you don't ever think that Clayton or a, a uh, youth leader um, isn't worth their weight in gold, they are. Because I have a team of incredible people and we as a team can't fill Clayton's shoes, but don't tell Clayton that, okay? <laughs> so pray for your story, the story of Jesus through you. For our kids, ask them about it. And the second thing is pray for our mission trip, please, because we're still working on that. We had a little bit of a setback, so thank you. <laughs> Just before... I sing, I want to say thank you for all the support. Uh, my wife and I have been overwhelmed with the amount of letters and prayers and text messages over the last many months, so thank you all for your continued support. Uh, this song is about the faithfulness of God, and sometimes when we step out, not uh, God calls us to something, and we, we would like to stay comfortable where we are, uh, there's a lot of challenges that come along with that. But we've seen how God has been faithful when we step out and follow him. And so that's what this song is about. Yeah. 
in my moments of fear through every pain every tear there's a God who's been faithful to me when my strength was all gone and when my heart had no song still in love he's proved faithful to me every word he's promised is true and what i thought was impossible I've seen my God do. He's been faithful, faithful to me. And looking back, His love and mercy I see. My heart, I have questioned, even failed to believe. Is He's been faithful, faithful to me? When my heart looked away the many times I could not pray still my God was faithful to me the days I spent so selfishly reaching out for what pleased me even then he's been faithful to me every time i come back to him he is waiting with open arms and i see once again he's been faithful faithful to me looking back his love and mercy I see though in my heart I have questioned, even failed to believe. He's been faithful, faithful to me. From my heart, I have questioned, even failed to believe. Yet he's been faithful. Faithful to me. He's been faithful, faithful to me. sing like that, okay? <laughs> You'll have to wait till then, though. Let's have the ushers come forward, and speaking of being thankful, last week's offering just blew us away. My daughter was with us last week when we took this offering. 
She said at their church, they have to beg people to give. She said, Dad, I couldn't believe it, how low key things are around here. I told her when I went to see her for Thanksgiving, we had the biggest offering we've ever received. Thank God for a generous church like Bible Fellowship Church. I have to um, let you know of a change in the bulletin. If you got your bulletin at the very top of the uh, second page there, it says the ladies' Christmas party and ornament exchange is Monday. If you would, maybe scratch through that and put Tuesday. If you come Monday, you'll be all by yourself, okay? But Tuesday at 6 o'clock is the ladies' Christmas party and ornament exchange. Did I make that clear? All right, now you're on your own if you come and you're all by yourself, okay? Saturday, December 7th is a baby shower for one of our missionaries, Jessica Hunter-Schmidt, who has always been an encouragement to me personally. I'm thankful that God is using her in a great way in the state of Wisconsin. Go Badgers, right? <laughs> and the next uh, item here, <laughs> sorry about that. I love you, Jessica. That was a shout out for you, okay? <laughs> Finley City Mission, collection box. I'm in trouble. I'm going to need armed escorts to get to my car after the <laughs> church service. <laughs> Finley City Mission collection box is back in the Fellowship Hall. The deadline for that is December 15th. And then on December 8th, which is next Sunday evening, we have a special couple coming up from West Carrollton, Ohio, which I think is a suburb of uh, Dayton. And this young couple would like to go to Mali, West Africa, which just getting there is quite a chore, but they need to do their language and things like that. But they're going to be coming and sharing their vision with us, so we want you to be a part of that, okay? Our Lord Jesus, we want to pause and again just say thank you. You've been so faithful, so faithful. I look out and I see uh, Robin's with us this morning, and I think of Betty Bibbler, who's been through so much and still has a ways to go. And I see Steve here this morning really encourages my heart when I see these folks because we're lifting them up to your throne of grace and we're calling out on your name through the name and the precious shed blood of Jesus and the power of the name of Jesus. We're praying that you continue to work in these lives as well as all of our lives, drawing us up close to you that we might love you more and serve you better. And now, Father, would you come once again and bless this offering we're about to receive and use it for your intended purposes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
please stand with us and we will sing our worship songs this morning. Lord, I worship, Lord, I worship, 
Look at that name in Isaiah chapter 9, please, if you have a Bible. Seven hundred years before Christ came to this earth, the prophet Isaiah wanted to encourage God's people, and he could think of no better way to encourage them by telling us what his name is. Verse 6. You look at verse 6 and it says, For unto us, God's people, a child is born. That's his humanity. Unto us, God's people, a son is given. That's his deity. If you're here today without Jesus Christ, this does not apply to you. This applies to the people who are born again. And if you're here this morning, you're not, you're not born again. I've been praying for you. This would be the morning that you turn from your sin of rejecting Jesus Christ and put your faith and trust in Him and Him alone. The only way to become one of the us, that's repeated twice in verse 6. Unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. And His name shall be called. Wonderful Counselor. Before we get to that, though, look at what it says. The government shall be upon his shoulder. Isaiah is looking past the immediate problems of God's people down to the first and the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you study the context of Isaiah chapter 9, you would discover that the great big empire of Assyria up north is pounding on the door wanting to come in and invade Judah and destroy Jerusalem. What do you do to give God's people a sense of hope? Well, you remind them of the coming of Jesus Christ, and this has reference to his first and second coming. Look at verse 2 with me. The people that are walking in darkness will see a great light 
you're in darkness this morning spiritually, we can help you come to the great light. His name is Jesus. Verse 3, he says, you have multiplied the nation, not increased the joy, but they joy before thee according to the joy in harvest as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. If you're here this morning in a state of depression, desperation, we can help you get to the place of joy. His name is Jesus. And finally, in verse 4, if you find yourself in captivity this morning, there's only one name that can break that yoke and set you free. Do you see that there in verse 4? His name is Jesus. And then it says his name is going to be called the Wonderful Counselor. Verse 6, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. How many of you need a wonderful counselor in your life? Those two names actually stand separate. I'm going to use them together this morning, but he is full of wonder. Would you agree? Jesus went about doing signs and wonders. This is a name that's ascribed to his miraculous nature and his miraculous power. I mean, to leave the splendor of heaven and to be born in a lowly manger, that was a miracle. To grow up and live a sinless life was a miracle. And to take that sinless humanity to the cross and have him nailed to that cross, dying in your place and in my place is a miracle. And then he was buried and then he rose again. And that is an absolute miracle. Then he ascended back to heaven where he is sitting this morning at the Father's right hand. If you're here this morning without a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, you've come to the right place. Because he wants to make himself known to you as a wonderful counselor. And I don't know about you, but I always need a counselor. Don't you? I went up for Thanksgiving to my son-in-laws up in um, north of Detroit. And my daughter, and they had us for Thanksgiving. We went up there the night before. And of all things, they just came back from the furniture store with a crib to assemble. And I had no idea that that was going to be my assignment on Thanksgiving Day. My son-in-law was busy cooking the turkey and a few other things in the kitchen. He was doing some things outside, and they kind of indirectly hinted at me putting the crib together. So I put the crib together, and sure enough, you know, my son-in-law is an engineer. He should have been the one for the assignment, but he gave it to me. I think he's trying to tell me something by doing that. But he came in when I'm about halfway through, and we're putting that thing together, and sure enough, when I finished with the instructions, and by the way, the instructions were wonderful. Diagrams, everything. Everything is so simple. But when I finished with it, I had four pieces left, right? You ever been there and done that? I thought, hmm, something doesn't look right about this. <laughs> He's an engineer. I'm sure he knew it before I did. But he wants me to figure these things out for myself. So I went back to step one and, and read the instructions carefully. And sure enough, I left out two very important pieces. So I had to disassemble everything and start all over again. But we got the crib together got the changing table together and the room looks wonderful all we need now is a baby so pray for us would you it won't be long I need a counselor hey I'm not as bad as I heard about a lawyer in Cleveland Tennessee and I I wondered if I should tell you this or not but it actually happened it's a lawyer right (laughs) they never lie this lawyer from Cleveland Tennessee was saying recently that uh, he wanted to take his family on a trip down to Nashville. But when they were young, the kids were young, they didn't have any money. So he went over to the, uh, what was it, the RV dealership, and uh, he asked how much was it to rent an RV. He said, well, that's the way to do it. Relatively inexpensive, and he asked the guy in charge of the RV center, he said, hey, are these RVs easy to drive? And the guy selling the RV or renting the RV said, well, actually, he said, whoever wrote this manual needs a medal because, I mean, he's diagrammed everything. Everything is so easy. So they took the RV, three children, his wife. They went down to Nashville, Tennessee, found an RV park. And the second day, his wife walked through the RV and saw this red light that started gleaming there on the side of the hallway. And she went outside and said, honey, that, there's a red light in the hallway. Would you come find out what, what's going on? He got the manual out and found out that the tanks needed to be released underneath the RV. So he found the spot in the RV center where he backed over top of it and kept reading the manual. And the manual said that there was a hose in the front bumper 
He said, I've walked in front of that bumper several times. I've never seen a hose. He didn't look close enough because if you open the side of that bumper, there's a hose there that hooks up to the tanks, the septic tank. It goes into the ground, and there's a little cap on the end of it. He kept reading the instruction manual, and it said that there was supposed to be 10.5 pounds of pressure in the tanks so that they would discharge properly. He thought it read 105 pounds. He told his wife, you do the easy job. You make sure the hose stays in the ground. I'm going to go over here and put air in the tank. Some of you are getting there before I am. <laughs> he said there was this nice bus that pulled up beside them. Brand new spanking bus. And the wife was over here holding down the hose saying, Honey, these tanks look like they are enlarging <laughs> the more air you put in them. When he gave her the command to release <laughs> the end of the hose, he said that thing stood up like a sprinkler. <laughs> All over the side of that brand new bus. His wife was hanging on for dear life saying, help us Jesus, help us Jesus. That's from a Christian lawyer in Cleveland, Ohio. So you'll have to ask him about the details. But the point of it all is, you're going to have to read the manual instructions carefully, right? If you want a wonderful counselor. I need a wonderful counselor. And what I did this week, since time was limited is I sat down and asked myself, what do I want in a counselor? And I've been going to school now for years, and each one of those classes, believe it or not, is a counseling session. I was in Sunday school this morning. If you have a heart for it, that's a counseling session. I've had people that God has brought into my life. They're my counselors. My mother was one of my greatest counselors. Dads, you're your child's greatest counselor. There are coaches in this room this morning. You're a counselor for those who play for you, who are on the team. There are deacons here, elders here. There are Sunday school teachers. We are your counselors. And I sat down this week wondering, what would I like to have in a counselor? And there are a couple of things that came to my mind right away. One of the things I would like in a counselor is someone who has empathy. That's a step beyond sympathy. They get down into your actual shoes and they feel what you feel. They sense what you sense. I was reading this week about Abraham Lincoln being one of the greatest counselors, among other things, this world has ever seen. Because his generals will tell you he could empathize with you if you made a mistake. One man who spent three years writing the biography of Abraham Lincoln studied his life carefully and, and, and wondered what set Abraham Lincoln apart from other presidents in our nation. He came to the conclusion it was his, his ability to empathize with those who served underneath his leadership. During the Gettysburg battle in the state next door to us in Pennsylvania, get this, over 51,000 men lost their lives in that three-day battle. The largest in American history. General Meade, George Meade, was in charge of the northern troops. And Abraham Lincoln gave him the command that whatever else you do, make sure you go after Robert E. Lee and take him out. And General Meade let him slip through his fingers. Abraham Lincoln was so disgusted with that. He sat down and he wrote a ripping letter that was very personal. He ripped on General George Meade up one side and down the other. But General George Meade never got the letter. They found it, among other things, after Lincoln had died in his desk. And the man who did his biography said that he thought Abraham Lincoln was so empathetic. He thought, well, what would I do if I was in that situation? For three days, you see people dying before your very eye. You hear screams and bloodshed all over the place. He came to the conclusion that Abraham, must have thought, Abraham Lincoln must have thought, well, you know what? If I'm General George Meade, I would have done the very same thing. And the war drug on for almost two years later before it was over with. I don't know about you, but I want someone who's empathetic in my life. Secondly, I want somebody who's a counselor in my life who's willing to take time for me. A taxi driver 
who was working third shift in New York City. That's a massive, 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 massive city if you've ever been there. Was about to finish with his shift like 3 o'clock in the morning. And he got a call to go to a lady's house, an apartment building. And he drove up to her door. And he beeped the horn. And he thought, I'm just going to beep one more time. And if she doesn't come out, I'm going to go on. He beeped again, she didn't come out, but something prompted him to go up to her door. He walked up to her door, knocked on the door, and there was an elderly lady on the inside. She said, I'm so glad to see you. Would you mind carrying my luggage? One suitcase, the old-fashioned vinyl kind of suitcase. So he took her suitcase out to his taxi and went back and got her by the arm and helped her down the stairs, and she got in the car. He said, where would you like to go? She gave the address, which is on the other side of town, and said, if you don't mind, would you mind driving through town? He said, well, that's a lot longer to go that way. She said, I know, but I'm I'm on my way to hospice, and I don't have any family. Would you mind driving through town? He said that she would give an address, and they would go there, and she would tell What happened in that particular building? That's where she used to work as an elevator operator. Go to an old warehouse, and she said, that's converted. It used to be a a bowling center where my wife, my husband, and I spent many hours together. Another place where they used to live, and all around town, till the sun started coming up in the morning. Then he drove her over to the convalescent home. She said, I'm tired now. Would you take me there? They got to this place, and he drove up underneath and over head uh, and she got out of the car she said how much do I owe you and he said uh, oh, don't worry about it I shut the meter off a long time ago she said well you have to make a living how much do I owe you and he said that's okay I'll have other writers he leaned over and he hugged her and she said to him you gave an old woman a little moment of joy He said when they took her inside and closed the door, he got in his car and he just drove all around town, realizing that it's not the big things in life that are important to people. It's the little things that you would take time to invest in an elderly woman on her way to hospice who never is going to return home. I looked at this passage that way. I wanted to ask myself this very basic question, what do you want in a counselor? And beyond that, what does God provide for his people as our wonderful counselor? And I'm going to go a little deeper with you this morning. I have to go through this pretty briefly. But I want to give you a crash course on counseling. I've had some courses in graduate school and postgraduate school. And I'll say it again. If I'm in Sunday school this morning, that's a counseling session. What do you want in a Sunday school teacher? What do you want in a father, a mother, a deacon, or an elder in this church when they counsel you? I'd like to give you this from my heart to yours. A very quick course in biblical counseling. My counselor is someone who doesn't stay on the surface with you. He's always aiming at your heart. You know what a psychologist is? The word suki, and some people major in this is the Greek word for soul, mind, emotion, will. And that's good as long as far as it goes. The problem is it doesn't go deep enough. Because you have a body, you have a soul, but you also have a spirit. And when you open up the scripture and start reading the word of God, he's aiming for your heart of all hearts. That's your spirit. My great counselor up in heaven is aiming for your heart this morning. And some of us met together early before anybody else got here. And we prayed that people would be changed in this service this morning because their heart would be changed. I want a counselor that deals with the root problems and not just all the surface issues. Buckle your seatbelt. Here we go. Crash course in counseling 101. Your teenager comes through the front door. They start dressing differently. They start using profanity. And you wonder, where did that come from? My wife and I were taking a leisurely walk in the mall yesterday. A bunch of teens passed us using vulgar language. 
What is a parent supposed to do when a teenager comes home and engages in this kind of activity? Well, the average person would turn their face away and say, hey, welcome to the 21st century. That's just the way it is. And we're just resigning ourselves to the fact this is the way it goes nowadays. And unfortunately, sometimes even Christian parents go there. They ignore it. On other occasions, the people who have the means to do it will send their child to a professional counselor where they get paid a lot of money to do that. And they'll come back from that place and now they'll be labeled, labeled with an inferiority complex and a lot of these words most of us can't even pronounce. You know what they do next? They give you a prescription, just numb the reality. And that's how we deal with it in the world. But my wonderful counselor goes deeper than the mind and the emotion and the will. He goes down to my very spirit, my heart of all hearts. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says, We have the word of God which is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces right down to who you really are, to the, your very motives, to the foundation, to the core of who you are. So now when I open the Word of God, I discover when I go to Sunday school or morning worship service or life groups or Wednesday night Bible study and prayer and places like that, I discover now when I open up the Word of God that it's really not that complicated. Your teenager is suffering from one or two or a combination of all three things. That's why they dress the way they act. They dress, and that's why they act, and that's why they say the sort of things they say. They got an attitude adjustment, but it goes deeper than that. It's a problem of character, which, by the way, is not being taught much anymore in our public education system. It used to be. Is it being taught in your home? Dads and moms, are you modeling Christian character? When I open up the Word of God, it comes down to three basic things. Brace yourself for these. Number one, bitterness. Sometimes the reason children act the way they act is because dad has never released his anger issues. Did you know that's the opposite of bitterness right there is to let it go? That's what the word forgiveness means. Just let it go. Deal with it. Get it behind you. Let it go. Sometimes we're caught up in temporary values. We love the things of this world more than we love the things of God. Or it comes down to this, moral impurity. I want to show you if I was just doing one Sunday school presentation, in one presentation, how this is so real, how this is so true. We're not dealing with the leaves. You know, in a tree, if you just take the leaves off, they're going to grow back. I go out here in the parking lot sometimes. I might pick weeds out of the parking lot. And guess what? They'll grow back bigger and better than ever before. But if I go get me, find me some Roundup somewhere, it's going to deal with the root issues, and they're never coming back. You know what? Spiritually speaking, dads and moms, we need to deal with the root system. And that's what my wonderful counselor up in heaven is doing for me this morning. He's going for my heart. And the real problem behind many a young person this morning who's going off radar spiritually and we throw up our hands, we don't know what to do. We've got to deal with the real problem. And the real problem, according to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15, is people, your child included, they are failing the grace of God. Look at what the Bible says. Look diligently. In the Greek, that literally means beware. That's like walking up to a yard, seeing a sign on the fence that says, Beware the dog. You don't have to tell me twice because I've been bit by a dog. Beware, lest any man come short or fails the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springs up and troubles dad. It'll trouble mom. It'll trouble the kids, it'll trouble the dog and the cat too, and the goldfish as well. I'm telling you, this thing is real. Are you struggling with bitterness this morning? God would have you get rid of it. The next verse goes on to say, lest there's any morally impure person, as Esau was, and he was also profane, more interested in things of this world, because for one morsel of meat, he gave his soul away. Isn't that simple? One passage of Scripture, Hebrews 12, 15, and 16. God's Holy Spirit comes along and He gets to the root cause of why we have problems in our lives. I don't know about you, but I want a counselor in life who deals with root causes. Who will look at you in the face and give you full disclosure and say, You want to know what you need to do? Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from from you with all malice and be kind to one another, 
tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. In other words, it's a choice you make. Did you hear what I just said? It comes down to a choice you make. You try to address a young person nowadays, and they'll say, well, the professional has labeled me X, Y, and Z, and that's why I do what I do. God's word comes along and says it's a matter of disobedience. It's a choice that you're making. And what you really need is the grace of God in your life. So moms and dads, before your children are even born, how about getting on your knees and praying to come to know Christ as personal Lord and Savior? Because that's really what it's all about. Unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. They, mean they need to be born again. Number two, what do you want in a counselor who's a wonderful counselor? A counselor that's filled with miracle working power. You want that counselor to display a godly example. By the way, moms and dads, that's really what your children are looking for in you. Whether you know it or not. Did you know that God gave you children to be little spies in your life? <laughs> And they watch you when you're breaking the speed limit. They watch you blow that stop sign. They're watching. Why can't they be preoccupied when you do that stuff, Bob? Now, the correct answer, you're not supposed to be doing that stuff. Okay, I, I stand corrected. But your children need a godly example. So do I. Do you know when I start studying the life of Jesus Christ, I discovered that he was the greatest example that ever walked the face of the earth. Philippians chapter 2, there was a problem in the local church. What did Paul do to correct it? He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, yielded his life, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Did you spend time on Facebook this week trying to improve your reputation? Are you more concerned about what other people think about you than what God thinks about you? You know, Jesus was in the middle when he was being crucified. And notoriously, that means he was the worst criminal. Imagine that. Beside robbers and thieves, Jesus, my Savior, was dying. He had a terrible reputation as far as this world is concerned. But he had dealt with that a long time ago. He had given that over already to his father. In other words, what was more important for my Savior Jesus is what his father knew what was going on than what people thought was going on. Are you concerned about your reputation? Do you know he humbled himself in John 13? The Bible says and girded himself with a towel and knelt down and started washing the feet of his followers. He had yielded these areas of his life to the Heavenly Father. We live in a society where people are preaching and protesting, demanding their rights. And Jesus, my wonderful counselor, surrendered his rights to the will of his heavenly Father. Jesus said, I did not come to do my own will, but to do the will of him that sent me. Jesus said, the birds of the air have nests, foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has no place where to lay his head. What I want in a wonderful counselor is someone who can display a godly example in front of me. Jesus came and he did it, and now he challenges you and me. In fact, he commands us to go and do likewise. Colossians 3 says, If you're risen with Christ, seek the things which are above, where Christ is sitting on the right hand of God. And set your affections on things up there, not on things down here on the earth. What do I want in a wonderful counselor? What do we have in a wonderful counselor? Number one, someone who deals with root problems, displays a godly example, and will deliver biblical advice. Do you know that's more important than anything else in the world? Someone who will look you in the eye, give you full disclosure, and say, buckle your seatbelt, but I'm going to give you the truth. I read somewhere this week, and I'm trying to remember what it said. The problem with good advice is that it gets in the way of my plans. <laughs> the problem with good advice is that it gets in the way of my plans. You know, God wants to give you advice this morning. Are you able to receive the truth? Here's one. You look at the life of Jesus, and he was constantly teaching his followers this truth, that gaining a deeper knowledge of Christ exceeds the value of gaining more possessions. You say, where do you get that from? 
The book of Philippians is a book that's designed four chapters so that you'll have joy. And every one of those chapters, he deals with another element that tries to rob you of your joy. When you come to chapter 3, it's things, 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 things. What did Paul, the apostle, think about the things? You know, your car, your house, material possessions, temporary fleeting values can rob you of true joy. Well, Paul said, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. My Lord, he went on to say, I count them as dung so that I may win Christ. Jesus will look you in the eye and give you absolute truth. That's what you want in a wonderful counselor. He'll also go on to tell you that developing stronger character is more important than getting what you want. That's total opposite advice nowadays of some parents. Some parents look at their children and say, you've got to stick up, you got to demand your rights. Stick up for yourself. The book of Hebrews talks about Jesus and it says, though he were a son. Imagine this, king of all kings, lord of all lords. Though he were a son, he learned obedience in his humanity by the things which he had to go through and suffered. One day in Matthew 19, a rich ruler came up to Jesus and asked the proverbial question, the question of the ages. What shall I do to go to heaven? And Jesus looked him square in the eye and said, if you want to be perfect, if you want to go to my heaven, go out and sell all that you have, give it to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. And then pick up your cross and start following me. You know, if you look at the context here, Jesus gave this man the commandments. And the man said, I've done all that. And essentially, Jesus says, really? Let's see if you've done all that. How about giving everything away to the poor? And then you come and find me. Pick up your cross and start following me. Let's see if you really did that. And the Bible says that man went away sorrowful. But Jesus, time and time and time again, gave full disclosure of the truth. He deals with our root problems. He displays a godly example, delivers biblical advice. And when I go to my wonderful counselor, every time I leave his presence, I'm inspired to do better and to do more, aren't you? When I read God's word, I'm inspired to do better and to do more. You say, well, you don't know my life. I've got problems. I've got trials. I've got adversity in my life. Do you know what he would tell you in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 if you've got adversity in your life? Adversity is preparing you so that you can have a ministry to help other people. One of the most valuable results of adversity is that through it you can receive God's comfort, but then you're able to share that with others who are going through similar trials and adversities. Here's what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Father of all mercies, the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all of our tribulation. Why, Paul? Why? So that we are able to comfort those which are in any trouble with the comfort wherewith we ourselves have been comforted by God. Did you know that's where God is going with your adversity, with your difficulties, with your trials? God is using you. To comfort other people. Now it makes sense when I read the book of Job. I see Job came through all that adversity. Even down to the place where he lost ten of his precious children. He could look up to heaven with tears in his eyes. And say the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'll still trust him. He's been so faithful. The second thing adversity is doing. It's, it's doing you something personally good. That's why people go to the gymnasium, they lift weights. They know long range, lifting weights is actually going to be for my benefit. It's not the end of itself. God's going somewhere with this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, later down the road in chapter 4, he says, we're troubled on every side, but we're not distressed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Why, Paul? Why? So that the life also of Jesus might be made crystal clear in our body. Do you know your trials are actually helping you to become more like Jesus Christ if you respond to them the way God wants you to respond to them? Here's another point. Usually I have three points, but I just went on a rant this week. I heard about the guy that gave all of his points on Sunday morning, and then he came back Sunday night and told the people, well, I gave you all the points this morning. Now my sermon is going to be pointless. Have you heard that one? Point number five, what do you want in a wonderful counselor? I want a wonderful counselor who's going to check up on me. 
Not just a one-time shot or a one-week shot or a one-month shot, but he's constantly following me, and he demands that I come back to him, and let's see how we're doing. He demands constant follow-through. You say, where in the world do you get that from? The whole book of Deuteronomy. The, book, the word Deuteronomy means the second giving of the law. God wanted to make sure that his people got into the promised land and fulfilled his word. So he told them in chapter 31, which is near the end of the book, he says, be strong, be of a good courage, don't fear, don't be afraid, because the Lord your God, he it is that will go with you. He will not fail you and he won't forsake you. You know who took the reins after Moses died up on Mount Nebo? It was a man by the name of Joshua. Interesting, right out of the gate in the book of Joshua, which is the next book, he looked at Joshua in the eye, God did, and he said, Joshua, haven't I commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. If you're here this morning as a child of God, this is God's word to your heart. With all the trials and the difficulties that this world has to offer, the Holy Spirit wants you to remember, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. As a matter of fact, Hebrews says the very same thing. This is New Testament. In Matthew 28, the last thing Jesus told his followers that walked the face of this earth before he went up to heaven is, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. You know who our counselor is today? Jesus has ascended, but he promised when he went back to heaven, I'm going to send you another counselor. He's the Holy Spirit, the great three in one, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, who lives inside my heart. That's my great counselor this very moment. John chapter 14, Jesus told his followers, I'm going to pray the Father. He's going to give you another comforter so that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world can't receive because it seeth him not. Neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he's going to dwell in you and he's going to be in you. The Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father has, will send in my name. He's going to teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I've said unto you. The Holy Spirit now takes residence within me. And he's my wonderful counselor. So in a dark period of time, Isaiah, the prophet, wanted to encourage God's people that in spite of this massive army that's assembling from the north called Assyria, I want you to understand that there's going to be a child and his coming is going to bring hope into this world. His first coming and his second coming. And by the way, he's come once. He died on the cross. He rose again. But he promised to come now and take the church up to be with him. And for seven years, there'll be the tribulation period. And after that, he's going to come again and establish his kingdom forevermore. And in that kingdom, the government's going to be upon his shoulder. His name is going to be called the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isn't that who you want to guide you in this dark world right now? Among all the many things I was browsing through this week, I came across this one, the old parable of the pencil. Have you heard this one before? A pencil maker was making all these pencils, and before he put them in the box, he would talk to the pencil and he would say something like this. Everything you do in life is going to leave a mark. Imagine a pencil maker counseling you. Imagine God up in heaven telling you this this morning. Everywhere you go, you're going to leave a mark. Be a good pencil. Number two, you can always correct the mistakes you make, right? Have you made a mistake as a believer in Jesus Christ? 1 John 1, 9, right? If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us. All in righteousness. Number three, what's important is on the inside of you. How many of you ever felt this one? In life, you'll undergo painful sharpenings, but it's only going to make you better. And finally, to be the best pencil in the world, you must allow yourself to be held and guided by the hand that holds you. There is a lighthouse off the shore of Cape Hatteras, in the Outer Banks in North Carolina, that has stood now for 150 years. And by the best estimates, some 2,000 ships have gone down just off those shores. But that shore line was designed and is designed in such a way that if you're not careful, a sailor can just easily crash their vessels on the rocks there. So someone had the idea to build a 200-foot 
huge, massive lighthouse. And it shines light into the darkness, preventing sailors from losing their vessels, losing their lives. Jesus promised that that's what he would do when he came into this world. And right out of the gate, he says, uh, I'm going to be a wonderful counselor to those who are willing to receive my counsel. And I wonder this morning, if you're here without Christ, why would you want to live another moment without him? Why don't you come running to Jesus this morning and let him begin to counsel you? I'm here this morning because of the counsel that I've received from a variety of people especially in including the pastor who led me to Christ and his wife and my Sunday school teacher early on, my mom, my dad, all the teachers I've had in college. I'm here this morning because of men in this room who've taken me aside and counseled me. And the thing of it is is that Jesus wants to be your counselor this morning, but you're going to have to trust him, and you're going to have to be obedient to his faithful word. Well, Father, thank you for this wonderful promise this morning. It inspired the hearts of God's people who were sagging, who were discouraged, defeated. You came along and offered them hope in the form of a child. Most of us in this room by now, we've learned that help is not coming out of Washington, D.C. But it will come from Bethlehem's manger. As a little child is born who will grow up and live a sinless life and take that sinless humanity all the way to the cross and suffer and bleed and die there on behalf of sinful humanity. Father, if there's someone here this morning, help them during this critical moment to step out by faith and repent from their sin and put their faith and trust alone in Jesus who can save them and start being their wonderful counselor. If there's a Christian here this morning who needs to get things right here at the altar, I pray you'd help them take full advantage of this moment as well. If there's someone here, Father, who needs to join a membership with us here at the church or be properly and scripturally baptized, help them to take care of that just now during this invitation time. We just tell you we love you and we need you more than ever. Come and be our great counselor. We ask and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your hymn book, it's page 57. Is that correct, Jay? And it's entitled, Cleanse Me. We're going to have it on the overhead this morning. But as we sing this, I want you to make this personal. Sing this as a prayer to God. Search me, O God. Know my heart today. Try me, my Savior. And know my thoughts, I pray. Shall we stand together, please? Hasn't it been good to be in God's house? Just what, 24 days before Christmas? How about that? Came fast this year, didn't it? 
But among all the hustle and bustle of this holiday season, let's not forget the real reason of it. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And if he's not your wonderful counselor, please don't leave this place today before you get a hold of me. I'll be glad to take God's word as long as it takes and show you how he can be your wonderful counselor. So, Father, we love you this morning. We tell you that. We tell you we praise your precious and holy name. That um, the way that Isaiah 700 years before it happened could inspire God's people was by giving them this promise. And then to think that it actually came to fulfillment just as he said it would in Bethlehem. Is just a wonder in and of itself. It's a miracle. And we're thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ who lived that sinless life and died on our behalf, rose again, and promised before he left that he would come and receive us unto himself. What a great promise. Lord, help us to walk in light of the counsel that you give us. Would you bless our people today with rest and use us for your glory to be a blessing to others along the journey. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, remember, no service tonight. Choir practice, I believe, is at 4 o'clock. Is that correct? So have a wonderful week, uh, Sunday afternoon.